everybody. Welcome to the Hallmarkies podcast. And we are really excited today. We are here for our monthly re- romance reading wrap up that we do. And uh, we have a, a very interesting book that we picked this month. It's kind of a, a different side of romance that we're talking about. And uh, we are talking about Heartburn by Nora Ephron. And I am film critic Rachel Wagner. And Bree is here. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on heartburn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this was. I, I mean, when you suggested, I was kind of like, "Does that fit this show?" You know, because it it's like the dark side, you know, kind of of, of romance. Yeah, but I like. You know, I'm curious. I think, uh, and it's one I've had on my to be read and to be watched list for a long time. So I'm kind of glad that I finally checked it off that list because I'm a huge Nora fan. Um, so I, it was kind of a, a good catalyst to, to finally do that. Yeah. I watched the movie a couple of months ago and I mean, I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, but like, I feel like this is a Nora Ephron movie that's just not really talked about a lot, uh-huh. if at all, in comparison yeah. to when everyone talks about Nora Ephron, you know the movies they're Mm -hmm. going to mention or they're going to quote. But like, this is never one I hear people talk about. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting film. I I mean, I had kind of a mixed response, but it was definitely, like I said, interesting. Yeah. Um, So yeah, the, uh, the summary for the book, it's the same obviously as the movie, but it's a heartburn is an autobiographical novel. So I would say semi-autobiographical novel based on Nora Ephron's marriage to and divorce from Carl Bernstein, her second husband. Originally published in 1983, the novel draws inspiration from events arising from Bernstein's affair with Margaret Jay, the daughter of former Prime Minister James Callaghan. So, <laughs> uh, like you said, this is very different than what we typically cover. You know, we're all about love and romance. It's romance reading wrap up. Um, but you know, it, but I this think it's healthy. What happens after the happy yeah. ever after, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's healthy to to look at the the other side every now and then. <laughs> um, I try to be kind of careful, to be honest, because I. I feel like as a single person, I need to keep my hope kind of alive, you know? And so things that are about divorce and, and I try to, I try to be careful and not, I I don't want to live in some kind of fairy world. I get that, but I need to remain hopeful too. (laughs) Yes, Um, definitely. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it is, there is sort of a genre of kind of divorce films <laughs> most yeah. recently fairly recently had marriage story i don't did you did you see that with adam driver no it was it was well done no, very well it. written uh well acted i mean it's a little over the top sometimes the acting but uh it's 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 a good movie uh i mm-hmm. I, I thought it was well done uh, but especially, uh, I mean, we're talking about the movie here, but especially during the late 70s, early 80s, uh, there was kind of this female empowerment, women leaving their husbands turning or, or kind of getting vindication or revenge on men in general. That was kind of a, a, a thing. I mean, you had a, an, a, an unmarried woman which was a big movie at that time. Uh, you had this, you have Kramer versus Cl- Kramer. You had starting over, you had nine to five, um, Manhattan, I mean, Annie Hall kind of less so, but s- sort of in that, I think in that, uh, in that discussion, um, there, uh, there were just a lot during this, um, time period, a lot of that, those kinds of stories and those kind of movies. Yeah, because I think like the years leading up to that, the expectation was you stay regardless of unhappy you are, like mm-hmm. uh, regardless of how unhappy you are. Yeah. And so maybe that time period was women were like, uh, no, screw this, <laughs> you know? 
Yeah. Uh, so it's it's an interesting thing because I also I think that for Nora Ephron, I think probably writing this was somewhat therapeutic because I don't think it was that far after her actual divorce that she wrote this book. And so mm-hmm. uh, it, it probably was something that was kind of helped her process, I yeah. would think. And I will uh, say, listeners, if you ever pick up this book, listen to the audiobook because Meryl Streep narrates mm-hmm. it and it's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> she does an amazing job. Yeah, she's really good. I listened to it as well. And I I think it helps the fact that this book is not very long. It's just like mm-hmm. a quick little mm-hmm. read. And so that helps you to not feel like weighed down by it. Yeah. Um, and so also because it's like it's told in first person, which takes yeah. a little bit of time to get used to. But I think the audiobook experience helps with that. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think that that's true. You do get, I, there's something about Meryl's voice that is very empathetic, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There, there's a warmth to her, to her speaking voice that, uh, and she had such a good relationship with Nora, not just in this movie, but, you know, she, of course, in Julie and Julia. Uh, yeah. She was directed by Nora playing Julia Child. Um, and they had, you know, a, a very good relationship. And that was her, the last movie that Nora directed of course Mike Nichols directed the movie but uh you know on a it was Nora's script and so it's got to be kind of Mm -hmm. surreal to to not only write a book that's basically a memoir of your failed marriage but then to adapt that same book into a movie and then see it portrayed on the screen you know sort of a variation of your relationship that's got to be a weird kind of process yeah (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) we'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast the heartland tv show on up faith and family fans of the hit family drama heartland know that up faith and family is the only place to stream every season of heartland including behind the scenes exclusive content all 15 seasons of heartland are available and ready to binge only in up faith and family And if you love Heartland, then you will love the dramatic new series, Mystic. Escape into a world of mysterious adventure, mystifying secrets and magical moments as we follow a group of horse-loving teens who are regulars at their local stables on the fictional peninsula of Calvary Point, New Zealand. First three episodes of Mystic are now available to stream with a new episode every Thursday. Go to upfaithandfamily.com forward slash hallmarkies today to sign up for your 14 day free trial that's up faith and family.com slash hallmarkies so it's also interesting that the movie at the time was not received well i listened to the uh to the siskel and ebert review last night and they were pretty tough on it and i can kind of see why i feel like the attempts at humor aren't the best like they come off as kind of um i don't know i don't feel like they come off as that realistic if they come off a little bit like somebody who's angry at their ex and wanting to kind of get back at them sometimes and uh particularly like the whole thing about the um the practical joke the prank that she does Mm -hmm. with uh for thelma about the disease. Oh gosh. <laughs> I <laughs> love that part. <laughs> it you just, tell the person, you tell your friend who you know is a blabbermouth, <laughs> like this made up story, knowing she's going to tell. Like <laughs> it was situationally funny <laughs> to me. Yeah. I mean, but it didn't feel that authentic to me to the character. Like that, it, in, 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 <laughs> that at that moment of time, she would choose to do that. Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It just felt a little silly for that moment in her life to me. Okay. I, I can see that. It felt more like somebody who's angry at their ex and kind of riding that, riding that kind of 
rather than like what her character would authentically do at that moment. But to me, but yeah, some of the humor I thought fell flat in the movie and I didn't feel like they actually had very good chemistry and I was expecting them to, Uh, but there were good moments um, with her character. And I, I thought that, I, uh, the, the, the relationship between her and her dad was interesting in the movie, um, and in the, the story because, you know, her parents got divorced and had all kinds of problems. Mm-hmm. And so, and were in Hollywood. So I think that, uh, that that was an interesting part of the story. Yeah. Well, I loved that Rachel was a cookbook writer. Um, mm-hmm. I, I have this thing with Nora Ephron and food. Like, so I think of Sleepless in Seattle. It starts at like, you know, a family dinner and she stops yeah. at the diner. And I think of, um, oh my gosh, when Harry met Sally, the diner scene, like she just does this thing with food that yeah. I love so well. So having Rachel be a cookbook writer and there's all these recipes and she even just even when she's describing situations that happened it's like oh I was taking over a pie and like food is always included so I I really love how she kind of wove that into there um I I do think I don't remember laughing so much at the movie but again like reading the book and just it felt like a one-on-one conversation like Meryl Streep's you're sitting at with her having coffee and she's telling you the story yeah. It landed a little bit differently listening to the audiobook. So, yeah. yeah, I think this is a situation where the book and the movie are like two totally different experiences, mm-hmm. yet the same at the same time. Yeah, I thought that Rachel was a, a good narrator. I mean, she's just, she has that Nora Ephron wit that you want to see. That's very, the commentary, the way that she's talking about life. I, she's so good at that. The way she includes these sort of, you can tell she was an essay writer in her original life <laughs> because, and her books yeah. of essays are great. Uh, but, uh, but the way that she sort of comments on being pregnant, the way she comments on the other women, the gossips, the, even the way she comments on her husband, I think uh, it makes you feel empathetic towards her. And she's just, you just feel Nora French charm coming through the character yeah yeah Yeah. and i it's like rachel's like living this you know washington dc upper middle class life and we're getting all the details literally all the details and all the meanwhile her husband's having an affair yeah (laughs) and it's like i i wrote down that i i really liked the way she wove in the recipes that that was charming so i agree with you you know that kind of writing about, oh, this is the perfect pork chop or, you know, kind of a, the way that she'd kind of weave that in was, was cute. Yeah. Yeah. And she does I do that. One, in one lady's films. Goodreads review. One lady's Goodreads review was like, uh, I agree with, she basically used one of the recipes she included in this book. And she's like, I haven't used a single other recipe for this dish since reading this book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, she really awesome. should have done a cookbook. Uh, because as you say, I mean, her, it's kind of, it's a- very apropos that her final movie was Julie and Julia, which is such a foodie movie. Mm-hmm. And yeah. yeah. So that makes sense. Uh, but um, there is no attempt to make him sympathetic at all. I mean, and it None. feels like <laughs> this, this is fresh after this experience. And I'm not saying he deserves sympathy, but there's just none there. This is from her point of view. Yeah. And he's the villain of the story. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm going out to buy socks. <laughs> right. <laughs> Always the excuse. <laughs> um, but it is hard. It, it is hard to feel empathy for somebody that goes and buys a necklace for his girlfriend when his wife's having a baby. It's yeah. pretty tough. That's pretty yeah. low. Yeah. I it mean, was it the movie, the book, it's you know, I think what she captures so well in both is just you will have continued to have done this had I not found out, had I not went through the drawers, or had I not heard it from someone and checked into it. Like you would have 
at this time period, the expectation is we just stay, we stay together. And like, you would not, I would never have known had I not found out. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was, it, it's, it, it, you don't really feel sympathy for him like at all. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. You never get it from his perspective at all. Yeah. Which is one interesting thing about Marriage Story. If you if you do decide to see, I think you'd like that movie, actually. If you like this, I think you definitely would like that. But they have it coming from both perspectives. It switches off. Who's uh, in that? It's Scarlett Johansson, Adam Driver. So. Okay. And it, like, it can be quite Scarlett witty. Movie? It can be quite funny. Okay. Even though it's also very traumatic at times. Yeah. Um, I'm curious for your thoughts on, uh, for the quote that I picked for this book. It's um, from the beginning of chapter two. It says, one thing I have never understood is how to wor- work it so that when you're married, things hap- things keep happening to you. Things happen to you when you're single. You meet new men, you travel alone, you learn new tricks, you read trollop, you try sushi, you buy nightgowns, you shave your legs, then you get married and the hair grows in. I love the everydayness of marriage. I love figuring out what's for dinner and where to hang the pictures and do we owe the Richardsons, but life does tend to slow to a crawl. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, as the married member of this podcast, <laughs> they're talking, um, what are your thoughts about that? I I th- I love that quote. <laughs> it's, it's, there's I, mean, a, I, I, I there's... do think that she lived a more exciting single life than I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things where like, you know, my, I have, my, my brother is single and in his thirties and to him, you know, the grass looks greener on my side because I'm married with kids and that's the life that he wants. And then I sometimes look at his life and I'm like, you can come and go when you want, you know, you don't have to, you know, answer anybody's calls or tell anybody where you are and you can work, you know, over time if you want and you don't have to explain that to anybody so I just think it's a you know one side looks great and the other side you know to to somebody that's not living that life but um yeah I, I mm-hmm. it's just it depends yeah but I do think that, that comfort you know that that comfort comfortable yeah I do it. think that more than maybe married life versus single life I think that I, this is just my guess. It seems like to me that when you have kids, Mm -hmm. even if you are single and have children, the things that start happening to you are all 99% things happening to your kids. Kid related. Yeah. Yeah. Your kids experiencing this new thing, your kids doing this, going out and doing stuff with your kids, making this experience for your kids. And as opposed to when you're single, everything is just kind of about you You, or when you're newly made, you know, when you're married, no kids. Um, Yeah. I don't think, I don't think that the, that it's that different between singles and married, no kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you become like, when you're married and a parent, so that's why it's just so important for us. Once you transition into that phase of life, like, to still have your own things going on, your own identity outside of someone's wife or someone's spouse and someone's mom, like you still have to have your thing, you know? Yeah. Otherwise, it you very quietly and gradually that becomes it for you. You know, you wake up and you go to bed, wifing and momming, and it's like, well, what did I do for me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's really surprising coming from someone like Nora because you know, from an outsider perspective, she did so much, you know, she was not like a a house frau by any means. Like she was a, you know, working mother, a successful writer, uh, successful, and she becomes a successful director. Uh, So it's interesting that at this point in her life, she would still kind of feel like her life not enough was happening to her. Yeah. 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 Okay. I have a quote too, but mine is way Mm -hmm. from the end. So she says, 
I looked across the table at Mark. I still love you, I thought. I still look at that dopey face of yours with that silly striped beard and think you are the handsomest man I've ever known. I still find you interesting, even if right now you are being more boring than the Martin McGronsky show. But someday I won't anymore. And in the meantime, I'm getting out. I am no beauty and I'm getting on in years and I have just about enough money to last me 60 days and I am terrified of being alone and I can't bear the idea of divorce, but I would rather die than sit here and pretend it's okay. I would rather die than sit here figuring out how to get you to love me again. I would rather die than spend five more minutes going through your drawers and wondering where you are and anticipating the next betrayal and worrying about whether my poor beat up middle-aged body with its cesarean scars will ever turn you on again. I can't stand feeling sorry for myself. I can't stand feeling like a victim. I can't stand hoping against hope. I can't stand here sitting with all this rage turning to hurt and then to tears. I can't stand not talking. (laughs) And I felt like, oh my gosh, this is the moment that we read this entire book for. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, it's so sad. I was just like, oh my gosh, because, you know, she's kind of all over the place through like a lot of the book. And then that moment, I was like, this is the moment we read this book for right here. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure tons of women can relate to that because it's not like the, uh, it's, it's, it's not like there's ever no reason to stay, but at a certain point, you have to decide when, when enough is enough, I guess, when, Mm -hmm. and that was her moment or her empowering moment. And it really must've been very therapeutic to write that. Yeah. Yeah. For Nora. Now I will say for everyone listening, who's yet to read it or watch the movie, this book is very dated. I don't know if it aged that mm-hmm. well <laughs> there's like some casual racism in there um, yeah. i couldn't stand the way that she described certain characters but it also really felt like a time capsule you really do feel transported to like i don't know the 80s 90s of washington dc and you're like amongst like a certain group of people um mm-hmm. so i mean just take that as you will but yeah like don't know if it necessarily aged the best but again i just think i if i wouldn't have listened to the audiobook i probably wouldn't have finished it but the audiobook definitely makes it worth it yeah and like i said it's a real short read so yeah yeah i mean it's not even let me see it is not even 200 pages it's 178 pages yeah i i did uh kind of laugh at certain lines like when um they talk about senators always talk about condominiums (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and Catherine O'Hara is probably my favorite part of the whole movie, as far as playing that yeah. character. In the uh, that she was really funny, I thought she was good. Yeah, in the playing the you know the lead gossip in there. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, 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 I don't. It's one I'm glad that I checked off my list. I, uh, uh, but I, I doubt I'll ever read or watch it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Same. I'm glad that I watched so, it and read it. Yeah. It was interesting. Uh, so the spice level, it's pretty mild, except for the obvious plot point of her being pregnant and her husband having an affair. There's not really, mm-hmm. there's no like steam or anything. <laughs> there's some language. And literally like I was like, when I was watching it, I was like, I can't imagine anybody but Jack Nicholson playing Mark. Like, he is the perfect Mark. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, it, I mean, just it, there's really no chemistry because they're the opposite of chemistry. <laughs> yeah. It's about. So it's not really applicable. And then the trope time is just, a, you know, a marriage in crisis. Marriage in crisis. The, the trope. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of my thoughts. I'd give it like a, I think a three out of five. Yeah, I think I did the same. Mm -hmm. The movie, I, I gave it two and a half. I think it's a little not as good as the book. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I felt like it dragged some in parts and whereas the book kind of clips along better and I just didn't feel like their chemistry 
um, as, as a couple. And I don't know. I just felt like it was kind of, I didn't feel like the humor worked in the movie for the most part. I felt like mm-hmm. it just didn't land for me. Um, it wasn't awful, but I think it's a little bit of a downgrade from the book. Yeah. We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Are you looking for that perfect gift for the postable, hardy, or hallmarky in your life? What about getting that t-shirt or hoodie that will help you stand out at your next holiday party? Now is the time to check out the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Full of festive designs by artists like Jessica Miller, Carrie from Hallmark Comics, and more. You can even have more than just shirts, but totes, cell phone cases, notebooks, mugs, and more. And it isn't just Hallmark. We have designs for Anna Green Gables, Man from Snowy River, The Nanny, and more. Every purchase at the merch store goes to help support the podcast and allows us to make the great content you know and love. There are frequent sales, so go to tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies or see the link in the description. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies. So anyway, I have tons of reading to talk about that I did in May. I was a machine this month. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's awesome. I read lots. Well, because I read uh, Bridgerton books four, five, six, seven, and eight. Because we were doing, I mean, I wanted to, I got on kind of a roll and they're super fast reads. It's not like it's a a hard book to read. Uh, But I got in a a thing and then uh, Natasha and I did the uh, Bridgerton book uh, uh, ranking episode, uh, which was really fun. And uh, so I read, yeah, I read book four, five, six, seven, and eight of the Bridgerton series. Um, so I guess I can kind of talk about all of them together. <laughs> um, it's Romancing Mr. Bridgerton is book four. That's Penelope's book. And it's in Colin. It's a lot of fun. It's it's the one that it that really focuses on Lady Whistledon. Because they focus that on on Lady Whistledon a lot more in the series than they do in the books. It's pretty much just this book. Uh, and it's a friends to lovers. It's cute. Uh, I liked it. To Sir, to Sir Philip with Love is Eloise's book. And she uh, she starts corresponding with this man who's this widower. And uh, he ends up proposing. So she goes up there. And they end up getting married. And uh, they have a very interesting romance. I enjoyed it. I liked all of these books. They were all good. When He Was Wicked, as the title would suggest, is definitely the most spicy of any of these books. <laughs> um, but it's really good. It was one of my favorites. It's uh, Francesca Bridgerton's book. And uh, she is uh, a widow. And uh, there's this man, Michael, who's been like desperately in love with her all these years, but he could never do anything because she was married to his best friend. And so he's like a great character. He's super conflicted because he d- doesn't want to be seen as this bad guy, like swooping in and taking his, his his friend's girl. But like he's so in love with her. And so that was great. Very entertaining. Um, and then the uh, the it's in his kiss was actually my favorite of all of them. Uh, this was book seven, uh, and it's Hyacinth and she starts kind of seeing this, uh, this, this man named Gareth who, uh, who is a kind of strange from his father, but there's this, um, treasure, I guess, left to him by his mother, but it's in the, it's in the house and he's not allowed to go in the house. And so they're all like sneaking around trying to find all the clues and sneaking around in the house. And it was fun. It was just a a fun time. And then the last one's called on the way to the wedding. And this one was fun too. This is Gregory's story. He's the youngest boy. And he, at the very beginning of the movie, he runs in on this wedding and he's like, stop, stop the wedding. I'm in love with you. Very dramatic. And, <laughs> and then it goes back and kind of tells the story he, uh, of how he got to that point because he was in love with uh, Hermione, but then Hermione wasn't interested in him. 
And then he started to get to notice Hermione's best friend named Lucy and they become friends. And it, I enjoyed it. It was really good. Uh, it was very exciting. It had more action than like the, than the rest of these. With, like I said, with him storming the wedding and everything. Um, and there was a like blackmail and involved. So uh, it was fun. But I enjoyed every single one of the Bridgerton books. They are they are a little bit steamy, but I don't think too bad. Um, but uh, I love the show and I love these books. I think they were great. Really fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, first up for me, I read I've I have read the first 14 issues of the Lumberjanes graphic novel series. I've been in a, a graphic novel mood just because I've been really busy and like I, you know, at the end of the day when my brain fog kicks in and like I want to read, but I don't have, I don't want a long commitment. It's just like these take like 10 minutes to read and they Uh are so fun. It follows a group of girls at at summer camp. And I mean, the first issue, I mean, it's the first, so show it some grace. I didn't think it was that great, but honestly, by the third issue, I was hooked. I've just been like checking them out from the library, literally like four or five at a time. It's so good. There's like magic involved and it's very feminist. And I just am having so much fun. And the good thing is, I think there's like over 50 issues, maybe over 60 at this point. So I have a long ways to go. Um, But I just love girlhood stories. And there's something about the summer camp setting that I just want to see more of. So um, that's the Lumberjanes series. I've read the first 14. Highly recommend them. And it's by... Noel Stevenson. Mm. That sounds good. It sounds good. Um, I'm curious of the of the those Bridgerton books that I talked about. Did do any does any of them stick out to you? Of like, ooh, that sounds like an intriguing plot. Yeah, I mean, I definitely am interested in uh, when he was wicked, like the sixth one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Just the the title alone pops out at me, (laughs) but I've read the first one. We'll see if I go back and read the series. I just, you know, historical romance, it just really has to, I I always end up enjoying them when I do read them, but I have to Mm -hmm. like really hype myself up to read Mm -hmm. historical romance. It's like my least read subgenre. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Well, the next one I have, I actually read because it had a quote from Julie Quinn on the cover. And so I was like, ooh, okay. It's called <laughs> All the Duke I Need by Caroline Linden. And basically in this uh, book, uh, the uh, you have this, uh, you have this man named Will who uh, is... Uh, uh, somebody of trade um, and he's trying to kind of uh, get higher up in the uh, in society or whatever so he takes this job as the steward for um, a uh, an estate and Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's only going to do it for a year he's only going to do this and so uh, but he starts to get to know Philippa the uh um, the, uh, niece, I think I forget anyway. Um, the, uh, is she's one of the greatest heiresses in England. Um, but she has this chemistry with Will, the steward, and she's not supposed to because he's from Trey, you know, he's the steward. He's not, you know, a, a, a Lord or whatever. And, uh, I don't know. I just found it very dreamy. It was good. It was fun. It is a little steamy. But not not too bad, not too. Mm-hmm. Not, I don't think too bad. Medium level, I'd say. Okay. Um, uh, so yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. the The Bridgerton are like I really think they they may be the best that you can do this style of romance. I don't know. I, I think it's, it'd be hard to top, the, especially as far as the series. Uh, they're very well done. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to compare to that, but what about, what about next for you? Well, next I have summoning up love and this is by Sinithia Williams. And I 
loved this book so much. So it's book one in her new series, the Heart and Soul series, and it is inspired by, <laughs> I love paranormal TV, and it is inspired by this show called The Ghost Brothers. It's three black males that go around the country investigating people's homes for paranormal. And when I started reading this, I was like, is this inspired by this show? And she's like, yes, I'm so happy that you caught it. <laughs> um, but the the heroine Vanessa leaves Atlanta after losing her job as a reporter and her, her boyfriend breaks up with her because his horoscope basically is like, I shouldn't be committing to anything right now. So she returns back home to South Carolina to this fictional town called like Sunshine Beach. And her grandparents own like a bunch of beachside cottages. And um, when she arrives, she finds out that her her grandmother has hired the Livingston brothers, the guys that investigate paranormal activity, because she believes that her recently deceased husband is haunting the house. And she thinks it has something to do with she lost her wedding ring um, like a few months before he passed away and she could not find it. And she thinks he's kind of sticking around to like help her figure out where it is. And she, Vanessa, thinks it's all scam. Like this is totally fake. And so the guy's like, you know, well, you should hang out and do some investigating with me. And you'll see like that we're not because they want to use her grandmother's house to like um, a TV producer is interested in helping them get their own show. So kind of the pitch idea, they need a place to film. They want to use her grandmother's house. So it is just all the close proximity goodness that we do enjoy. It is a little steamy, so just forewarned, but it's still also like really like sweet small town Southern romance, and I really loved it. So mm -hmm. that is Summoning Up Love by Sanithia Williams. Mm, cool. Well, my next is a novella. It's uh, There Goes the Groom by Esther Hatch. Esther Hatch is my friend. She's been on the podcast and a number of times she came on this show actually uh in uh, dis uh january um uh, and so she's a really fun writer she does historical romance clean historical romance obviously i'm a little biased because she's my friend in real life so take it with a grain of salt but i i enjoyed this one uh this one uh is kind of a clever take on the, the uh arranged marriage marriage of convenience trope i guess um you have this character named Matthew, who is uh, betrothed to this woman named Lucy. Um, and she's not excited about the idea of getting married to this man. And so she plays a, a, a trick on them. Uh, she He knows that she's young. She's, uh, at, at the time of their betrothal, she's only 17. But uh, they're not going to get married for some time. But she plays a trick on him. And she has her younger sister at the beginning of the story introduce herself as, as, as Lucy. So he thinks, oh, my gosh, I'm marrying this, like, literal child. Like, <laughs> like a little girl. What? Uh, anyway, then it jumps up a few years. And he's still betrothed to her. But he's you know, not very excited about it. And, uh, and she uh, kind of decides she wants to get, she wants to um, uh, get to know him better. And she uh, kind of sneaks and gets to um, know him uh, while he's working. Uh, he's kind of undercover working as this, um, delivery guy i don't know anyway she she starts working with him and doesn't know he doesn't know that that's her he still thinks that she's like the little girl um and so uh, anyway they start to get to know each other it was cute it was a, a fun a fun little story i thought she did a good job okay. so that was next for me um what about for you um, what am I going to talk about next? Okay, so I'll talk about the beginning of the month. I read Summer on the Island by Brenda Novak, which is a just, oh gosh, it's such a good like romance, women's fiction. I really look forward to her like spring releases each year. They just get better and better. Um, It really, it's like three different women's stories, but the one that really sticks out to me is like two of them. One of them was married to a guy and the other woman was his mistress. And 
had no idea until like he was like buying her a place to stay and someone finally came to her and was like he's married and these two wind up being friends and they are spending this the summer together on this island i i can't remember but i feel like it was like off the coast of like savannah like down south southeast uh region and i mean they they all three of them have a really fabulous friendship but like now that their marriages, like their divorce is finalized and over. She is kind of having these thoughts of like, do I want to be with him now? You know, but just she really has to see things for herself. And it's just tons of shenanigans that are going on. But really, it's just like three different women finding themselves, finding love again, moving on after heartbreak. And I just love it. So that's Summer on the Island by Brenda Novak. All of her like April, May releases every year. They just get better and better. So I love this one. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Sounds really good. Perfect for summer. Summer read. Um, All right. Well, my next one gets best title award as far as I'm concerned. It's a Holly Jolly Diwali, (laughs) which I think is a great name. Yes. By Sonia Lolly is her name. And Mm -hmm. uh, this is about a kind of workaholic woman uh, Indian American woman who uh, isn't very kind of in touch with her culture. Uh, and she she's always asking everybody, what is Diwali? Diwali? I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. But um, uh, and she doesn't know. She doesn't know why they celebrate it. She doesn't know what the lights mean. And and uh, even her parents are kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> we just we just do it. They don't really understand. And her friend is getting married, and so she decides to come spur of the moment to go to uh, to uh, visit to go for this wedding in India. And while there, they're celebrating Diwali, and she gets to kind of come into uh, her own with her culture and understand what the importance of the holiday. And she meets this man named sam at the wedding and they have this instant connection it's really cute um i i I enjoyed it it was a lot of fun oh it sounds adorable yeah yeah i love the title and great title yeah very well holly jolly diwali (laughs) holly jolly diwali Well, my next one is The Dachshund Wears Prada by Stephanie London. And this was adorable. And our lovely friend, Terry Wilson, who we love so much, was one of the authors who blurbed it. So I just knew I was going to love it. Um, But in this one, so the main character, she's like a social media person. And like she was working with this like pop star, basically. And goes this whole situation goes viral where the pop star drinks something, throws it up. They don't realize it's live. Like, and of course our heroine who's in charge of all of this, like she goes down to. So she's kind of like blackballed from the business. And one day she's kind of a single mom. She's raising her like 14 year old sister. They're out and about up comes to them, this little cute dachshund. And the owner is, um, he recently inherited her once his grandmother passed away. His grandmother left the dog to her and her, her name's Camilla. And she's like evil. Like she doesn't like anybody, but she like goes straight up to the heroine. And he's like, well, she loves you basically like offers her a job, tells her how much money he'll pay her. And she finds that she basically winds up being like the assistant to this dog, like taking her to dog psychics and play dates. And like, she's like the mean dog on campus. Like, they're like, how long are you going to last? Because she doesn't like anybody. But um, I mean, she really becomes like her person, like Cam- Camilla as, you know, a dog, like just trusts her instantly. But this also ends up being their romance. Obviously, they're spending lots of time together. She's at the house a lot. And it's just so sweet and swoon worthy. It's definitely steamy. So if that's, you know, it's not crazy steamy, but it is in there. But it's also really heartwarming. It's it's cool to see a woman in her late 20s and early 30s, like, step up to raise their sibling, you know, and, and you see the anxiety that her sister has, like, you know, mom didn't choose me. Like, if you move on and you have a relationship, are you going to leave me too kind of thing? Um, and her sister's so driven. She wants to be a dancer. And that really, like, fuels her 
you know, motivation of like, I have to financially get back on my feet. Like I'm raising this person. So it is sexy. It's fun. It's sweet. It's very New York. Like it transports you to the, the New York Stephanie London creates. And I just, I loved it. I loved that like the, the driving force was this little dachshund. So um, that's the dachshund wears Prada by Stephanie London. That sounds really good. I like that title too. Yeah. <laughs> Very good title. Uh, all right. Well, the last one that I read is called Cowboy Ever After by Jenny Martz. And I guess I'm reading school- that now. Oh, you are? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I won't spoil, of course. But uh, but I read it because I interviewed Jenny, uh, which you'll, you all will hear that interview coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, they're they're actually Hallmark Publishing is going to be sponsoring the podcast for a week, which I'm so excited about. Um, so that's awesome. Uh, I'm certainly hoping that I would like it, <laughs> um, but I hope I like every book that I read, and I uh, I did really enjoy it. It was it was very good. It's about this uh, woman who. It, what made it fun is that it's about it, it's a it's it's a book about a writer particularly romance novel writer. So I think that added kind of a fun spin on it uh, Mm -hmm. that uh, whenever you, we have the book within a book kind of a thing going on, which she sort of do here because she's got this character uh, named, I think it's Sassy Spock, I think is the name or Sassy something. And yeah, Sassy (laughs) is the name of her character. I love that her editor is just like, you write these things and you've never actually (laughs) done them. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and so she's always trying to get in the the spirit of sassy, and um, her editor sends her to uh, Montana to uh, get some real ranch life because she writes all these cowboy romance stories, which is again fun because Jenny Martz actually does write tons of cowboy romance stories, and so it was it was a little meta, you know, I think going on there. But uh, anyway, she goes to Montana. And, uh, of course, the brother that she's staying with, the brother of her uh, publicist um, that she's staying with is named Luke. And he is very dreamy. <laughs> uh, but he's been, you know, hurt in the past because he lost his wife and, you know, the hot widower kind of a thing. Um, he's just this great, sympathetic, wonderful cowboy. And and so, you know, you can kind of figure out from there. But I, I liked it. I thought it was really cute. and. Again, I like that kind of book within a book and thinking about her characters and can I be more like my characters and and stuff. So that was fun. Yeah, it's adorable so far. I'm loving it. Mm, Yeah, it'll be fun to hear what you think next next month when we get the update. I think I'll be going live with her close to the release date. We'll see. Oh, cool. I'm I'm loving. I that first chapter I was hooked. So, (laughs) (laughs) Um, well, I read three. Non fic three more nonfiction books this this month. So, I read Body Work by Melissa Febos. Guys, it's a really short book about writing, like probably the same length as Heart Bo- Heartburn, if not shorter. Um, she's one of my favorite memoirists. So, if you're you know an aspiring writer or you just need some writing inspiration, go check this out. It just came out from Catapult, I think, like a month ago. Um, I love her memoir Abandon Me. I love her memoir that came out last year. Well, it's more like a collection of essays called Girlhood, but that's Body Work by Melissa Phoebos. Go check it out. And then Hmm. I was on an Efron kick. So I read Left on 10th by uh, Left on 10th, A Second Chance at Life by Delia Efron. And oh my God, this is so good. Oh, really? Oh, I got to read it. It's so good. It talks about her, of course, losing Nora and then finding out that she essentially has the same illness that Laura, that Nora had. And then, losing her husband as well and fa- like falling in love and kind of the guilt of falling in love after you've lost the great love of your life. And then as soon as you find this love, finding out you are sick, like you do have something that can kill you. And I mean, it's it's tough to read at parts. I mean, she's so sick that she's like, please just talking to the doctors, like help me die. Just I just want to get it over with. Um, but second chances, it's it's so good, you guys. The audiobook is fantastic. She narrates it herself and she's got like that sassy New Yorkness going on. I thought it was incredible. And then I reread Everything I Know About Love by Dolly Alderton. 
And it was a five star read again. And I wish I was in the UK because they have adapted it to like a TV show and it will be coming out soon. And I just mm-hmm. feel like I'm not going to get the opportunity to watch it. But I love that book so much. So just essays on, you know, relationships that have failed and realizing how much you love your girlfriends and how much those friendships mean to you. It's an incredible read. And she narrates it herself as well on audio. So if you're interested, go check that out. That's Everything I Know About Love by Dolly Alderton. And that's my reading for May. (laughs) (laughs) That is pretty impressive. Uh, I think we both did pretty good this month. We did. We did. (laughs) Tons of audio and graphic novels, people. Yes. (laughs) Uh, And in, uh, so for next month, we are going to be doing uh, Emily Henry's new book, Book Lovers. Yes. uh, Because we've uh, enjoyed her books in the past. Have you read this? I haven't read it yet. I, when you mentioned it, I was like, okay. This is the sign that I need to read it. <laughs> oh, we, why have you been not wanting to read it? Well, I mean, I, I read her first two books and I loved them. Um, this one, I'm interested to see our thoughts because, okay, I'll be honest. I've heard that like it basically feels like a small town Hallmark type of story, but that she doesn't want it to be that at the same time. So I'm mm. really interested with us loving that how we perceive it, you know? It's interesting because uh, on Goodreads, it has, I mean, way less. It has 73,000 ratings as opposed to people we met on vacation, which has 469,714 and Beach Read, which has 438,146. But it has a higher average rating than Mm -hmm. either of those Mm -hmm. books, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I I feel like we'll probably I hope we love it. I just have been seeing a lot of people like die hard mm. romance readers that are like, you're doing this thing, but trying to disguise it like you're not doing this. Oh, thing. I hate that. So that's gonna yeah. be interesting to see. Yeah. So I'm like, what well, we, think. we love this thing. So let's see what <laughs> Rachel and I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, let us know what you think of all the different books we talked about. Uh, and uh, and if you have seen Heartburn or read the book, I uh, would love to hear your thoughts about that as well in the comment section or on Twitter. And Brie, where can people find you? I'm on Instagram at Brie.unabashedly, and I co-host the Categorically Romance podcast. Great. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. So check that out. And also make sure that you're following the podcast at Homeworkies Pod and Homeworkies Podcast, all of our social media. And uh, if you're listening on iTunes, please leave your five-star ratings and reviews for both of our podcasts. We'd really appreciate it. And uh, if you are watching on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We appreciate that. We'll put our Goodreads in the description. You can follow us on there. Keep track of what we're reading. And uh, and we can, we can see what you're reading as well. Give your recommendations. And uh, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, check out the Patreon group and merch store. We'd be very grateful. And we'll talk to you later. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.